Hajime Mashte, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or wherever any people are in the world. I'm Nick. Uh, I'm a senior production engineer at Shopify on the Ruby and Rails infrastructure team, and I'm incredibly grateful uh, to the encouragement I get at work from my team to research things like this. I'm more than grateful to the organizers and people who work hard to put on conferences like this. It's been a hard few years, and I'm so happy that we are back at it talking about Ruby. I have a keen history, interest in uh, Ruby history. I maintain the past Ruby's newsletter, which is kind of like an in this day in history for Ruby. And I spend a lot of time reviving old gems and old Ruby patterns that I think still should be used today. But the focus for today's talk are web frameworks. So in the 2000s, everyone was writing a Ruby web framework. There was a time in the newer days of Ruby, particularly when you couldn't easily get a paid job writing it, when there was a tremendous amount of web frameworks coming and going. People would debate design patterns, configuration and modularization versus convention. And what was the Ruby way to write the web? So what I'm looking to achieve today is I want a higher level discussion about some of these supposedly forgotten frameworks to remind people that there was a time when everyone was seriously experimenting with these and that we should take that same experimenting spirit into the future. I will do this by talking you through three frameworks and one standard library gem that I think have been mm, kind of forgotten and are worth looking at. Maybe not the standard library gem. I did run these by a Ruby core team member. So hopefully um, you get stumped by at least one of these. Maybe not because I have such an esteemed audience today. First, got to talk about CGI. For those who aren't familiar with it, the common gateway interface is a set of standards that define how information is exchanged between the web server and a custom script. A simple way to think about this, if you're not familiar, you've probably heard of writing your own Ruby framework sitting on top of Rack, right? For quite a long time, which by the way, 3.0 dropped yesterday, so that's quite timely. Um, it's a lower level, old school alternative that people were using before other ways became ubiquitous. Um, this is a standard that you can install on your Unix system and it defines how your scripts talk to HTTP requests. Because of this, the Ruby standard library has a CGI library that people can still use to this day, or the TLDR here is this is another Rubyism that we've inherited from Perl. Uh, CGI scripts are very big with Perl. So having a brief look at doing this today, uh, actually you can just use raw Ruby. So if you have your CGI script set up like this, put statements will actually work if you wanna be really bare metal. But if you require uh, the dependency in there, immediately you get a lot of beautiful Ruby helpers, right? Uh, the, here with the header that we see, or we can create you know, forms in this Ruby block syntax with like HTML head, body form, H1, and actually a lot of stuff looked like this, right? Mark a B or flex today, uh, this is quite a Ruby pattern that you probably didn't realize was this old school. And it also handles parameters. Now you might think, Nick, you know, this is a bit intense though, like would anybody do this? But actually, historically, this was actually used. Uh, Kirk Haynes, who uh, used Iowa and is the current maintainer of Iowa, which unfortunately I won't be talking about today, which is a web framework around since 2001, did talk about people using CGI scripts. Now they may not have been popular as tooling started to blow up, but it was something that people considered as a valid option. So my assessment of CGI.rb as a standard library gem is you can legitimately use this today and you should uh, for experimentation or if you're writing a framework possibly, but again, I'd recommend Rack. Uh, you just need to configure this along with a server like Apache. Um, and from here, your limits are only Ruby. It would just be pure Ruby working here. Uh, again, it'd be fun for a sandbox project, but definitely not something I'd see as a viable like corporate job option, unless I was just trying to sneak some Ruby on, a, on as a lightweight handler on a server. But okay, now we're looking at standard library. Let's talk about some real frameworks that you may or may not have heard of. So for our first one, that is Nitro. I really hope that at least half the audience haven't heard, heard of this one. What was Nitro? Well, first off, it wasn't rocket science. Uh, it was first released in October of 2004 by George Moscovitis and Trans. Uh, this was back in the days where you could just have your moniker as an engineer, and that's what you're known by. You can think of mental guy, why the lucky stiff, and Trans was the same. So it was George Moscovitis and Trans. 
Uh, the, just to give you the timeline for it, the last release was in 2009. And based on my historical analysis, it peaked just before 2007. However, it inspired several future web frameworks after it. So what did Nitro have to say about itself? Here's the description from the docs. And I'll read this verbatim. Nitro provides everything you need to develop professional web applications using Ruby and JavaScript. Nitro redefines rapid application development by providing a clean yet efficient API, a layer of domain-specific languages implemented on top of Ruby, and the most powerful and elegant object relational mapping solution available everywhere. Nitro is Web 2.0 ready, featuring excellent support for AJAX, XML, and syndication while staying standards compliant. So Nitro took itself seriously, as you can tell from its own mission statement. But what was the community saying about it? And this is why I love Ruby Talk, and I love this hosted on Discourse today. It's very easy to research this stuff. And this is what the community had to say in about uh, 2006, right? And they, for them, Nitro was a serious choice as well. So they're talking about it versus another popular web framework at the time. And it, it lends itself to a different way of thinking about the web and some of its dependencies as well. And they said the best part, but well, this is from James Britt, the best part, of course, is that it's not an either or choice. And if you're serious about web development in Ruby, you owe it to yourself to spend some time with Nitro, Iowa, and other frameworks. Ruby gives you choices, pick the best tool for the job. So for how big this was, and the fact that I'd never heard about it before this research is quite interesting. So what was in Nitro? And let's look at a few of the docs here. So we talked about four core dependencies. The first one is RAW, which was the web application middleware, or really like the app itself or the framework itself. OG, which was their ORM, which was written, even though it's a separate gem, bespoke for Nitro. Uh, Facets, which is still around. It was a very popular uh, Ruby gem to give you a lot of Ruby goodness uh, on top of the standard library back in the day is very popular. And but that, again, that's a third party dependency that they're kind of talking here as a first class dependency. And same with jQuery, right, which was we, we might joke about jQuery now, but like 2004, come on, you know, that's, that's big stuff. But one remarkable part of this application that's unique amongst the three today is it predated Rack. So it has its own framework implementation sitting atop CGI that we just referenced. So if you want to look at a full Ruby application built without Rack as a dependency, this is the one to look at. And I don't have the link up just yet, but it, it, the GitHub path for it is Nitro Project. It's still up there. So there's a fair few features that they talked about. The biggest ones were a large claim that you could write your app as you wanted, like the PHP style automatically transformed into Ruby code, or you could use a traditional MVC pattern. So Nitro appears to have taken the extreme on not being opinionated and very much being opinion over convention. I avoid saying configuration over convention because I'm unsure if it actually had a prohibitive amount of configuration, despite supporting a lot of different permutations. Nitro also supported fragmented and action-based templates that would support componentization, and additionally supported those, uh, including those fragments at compile time or runtime, and everything else, right? So uh, Nitro also talked about how it utilized the DRB library, which if you haven't played with that, uh, distributed Ruby, there's books on it, go have a look, it's really neat, to provide distributed sessions when running your application over a server cluster. And it also included, which we take for granted today, scaffolding mechanisms to speed up development. And of course, like I said before, it kind of treated some third-party dependencies as first class. But I wanna pump the brakes right here and drill in on one dependency that I think is super cool and would like to look a bit more at, OG. I don't really get pronunciations of this. You know, sometimes there's a capital O, sometimes a little O. Do you go OG? I mean, could I just say this is OG and then everyone's going to call it OG? Object graph is what it stood for. It made a lot of bold claims about its features, but it talks about, and I really want to look at this, automatically mapping standard Ruby objects to schemas. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff to support Postgres, MySQL, SQLite, quite a lot for 2004. Um, and it can reverse engineer legacy database schemas, but and the typo is not mine. This is from the docs. Um, but let's look at like what what does this look like in action? Voila, this is an OG object, it's basically a plain old Ruby object. Sure, you defined your two S, and yes, you've given your outer accessor a type. 
because it is a database. But that's the basic thing. And it will map to the database on load and it will make any changes or evolve the schema as needed. You can continue to pass in more things. You've got the has many, you can build the relations, you know, those are built in methods that are additional. And you can also specify uniqueness. Uh, the config was pretty simple. So you just had a hash where you could, you know, determine if you want to destroy the table created from earlier runs, uh, what your store was, and then of course name, user, and password, and then you just ran the setup command. Now I know you want to have a little look at this just for two seconds, so I'll let it happen. Um, so you have this evolve schema method inside of OG, and it iterates through these objects. And it makes the transformations as needed as it goes on the setup method. So you can have like rename schema, add column, remove column, rename column, just by running that one method and giving it some Ruby objects. Is this feasible, scalable, or same? I'm not exactly sure. But what I can tell you is that this is conceptual compression on steroids, and I love it. Write your vanilla Ruby objects with just a tiny dash of extra information around typing, and boom, there it goes. I'm unsure how it worked with validations, but since this is raw, pure Ruby, I think you can do whatever you want, and it would infer from there. Now, going back to Nitro, one of the problems that I ran into, example code is referenced a lot in the documentation, but it's not available on GitHub, which is annoying. There's only four publicly available commits on GitHub. So the options are to rip down older versions from rubygems.org, which I'm not sure like how that would work actually. Or in this case, go to the pre RubyGems repo website and find the code directly. Remember, we're predating rubygems.org, nearly predating RubyGems at this point, which was built at RubyConf 2004. Um, and we need to remember that a lot of the conversation and all this was you know, pre-GitHub and it'd be hard to surface, right? But I was able to find a few things to, to look at this now. And obviously, you can't really run it on modern infrastructure. Um, a Hello World uh, document, which was uh, pretty straightforward and nothing too, too crazy here. I'll let you, I'll do this with all the apps. I'll let you have a look at a traditional directory here. And I'll have more commentary on this later on. But again, you could probably navigate your way through this directory. And similarly, um, the controller handling. So this is if you're doing the MVC approach, which they talked about, which I couldn't find the documentation for the other approaches. Um, and it, it did have built-in support with pagination, which is which is quite neat. And the templating um, does seem to support componentized partials as well, which is nice. But you heard me talk about scaffolding earlier, and I couldn't find many references to that at all. And I wonder if that kind of was talked about a lot, but didn't end up in the big feature set in the end, or just kind of fell by the wayside. So my assessment of Nitro is it has a lot of powerful concepts, but it's heavily limited by being tied to Ruby 1.8.2, so you'd need specific tooling to be able to use it. It's even harder if you're on an M1, which many people are. But OG is worth a second look in 2022. This idea, at least for personal projects and experimentation, of converting raw uh, plain old Ruby objects into database uh, tables and rows is quite interesting. And finally, for the Nitro, the framework itself, for all its promises, is hard to surface. The original code is not on Ruby gems. The examples don't appear to exist anywhere and weren't archived on archive.org. And the existing testing isn't revealing enough to be interesting, which is a shame. Um, the mailing list seemed relatively active for four years, which is a long time in Ruby terms. And people were using the framework. It seems to have had novel ideas with scaffolding and supporting variable approaches like writing PHP. Um, and it was referenced for years on linked lists as a way to write Ruby for the web. So for the purposes of a future talk, somebody could invest time solely on working through the existing code to get it running in 2022, and then explore example use cases to see if there's anything more interesting. Number two, Ruby waves. Uh, for this one, a lot of the canonical discussion were through a few talks. So I did actually screenshot and present a few slides from that. So it will be a bit fuzzy. I'm just letting you know ahead of time, two images from the 2000s are gonna be lower quality. So it was introduced in February of 2008 by Dan Yoder at AT&T Interactive. So curiosity, a lot of Rubyists seem to be working at AT&T Interactive in 2008. It, however, was mostly dead by 2009, which is a very quick life. 
It had an emphasis on a resource-oriented architecture and thinking about the shift to the cloud, which we now kind of take for granted, right? Um, this was originally presented at RubyConf uh, 2008. It was also presented at LACon, GoRuco, and Lone Star Ruby as well. So if you remember any of those. Um, and I just want to jump straight into one of its core dependencies, which kind of influence how you write an app in Waves. Functor is a critical part of the unique ar architecture. What Functor gave, and, th and this was written under the Waves organization again, uh, as its own dependency, but it was written for Ruby Waves. But it gave argument pattern matching in Ruby, in Ruby for you. So let's just see vanilla functor first. So if you have your uh, class here called repeater and you have an adder accessor, you include the functor method um, mix in and you define these functors. What it lets you do is when you hit that method, it will hit a different method based on the pattern. And in this case, it's the argument that you're passing in. So if uh, repeater.new.repeat is called with an integer versus a string, it'll actually hit different methods. And this is what Functor lets you do with pattern matching again in 2008. It can also be used directly to implement you know, pattern matching here, like Functor new for Fibonacci uh, is a <laughs> contrived example. And you can even define your own matchers as seen here with a Lambda. Now Functor does have a slight performance cost, but it did alleviate it with some good built-in configurable caching. But what made this dependency so critical to Ruby Waves and how was it used? So going back to Ruby Waves, uh, using these slides, here it is in action uh, given pattern matching, right? So you have this resource and when you reach this resource uh, via a mapper, which I'll show in a minute, if it's a get request and with certain parameters, it will return FIDO. So this is uh, like even smaller than a hello world, but that's the pattern that it went through and it would support you know, matching queries and, and, and accepts to do even more interesting things. So let's see a hello world example of this in an app. Uh, this is you know, just a very tiny version. It supported a, a map class, which allowed you to either here directly serve your query with Functor, or you could use it to pass on your request by just inspecting enough of it to go to the correct resource, whether it was an article or a post or a blog or a user. Uh, but this, this is what you do for the tiniest amount of Hello World. What are the architectural and design concepts behind Waves? Resource delegation, which I just hinted at and I'll show in a second, just looking at enough of the request to tip you off. But resources are, you know, ordinary classes. So you can leverage the full power of Ruby, like inheritance, mix in, modular, encapsulated code design. And it's, you know, not a special construct. It's just instance methods on resource classes. And if you've ever dealt with large applications and route-based frameworks, after a while it gets difficult to wield and manage the routes. So knowing the things that we match inside the resource is quite handy. And if you end up with five to 15 functors inside of a resource, you might realize it's time to extract it out. And here's what I showed is kind of a diagram of that delegation, again, using map to maybe take the front part of the request or however you want to determine that yourself and pass it on to a resource. They also have the concepts of layers and foundations, which let you include what you need. So here is the example of the foundation classic. Foundation Classic included MVC, which is, of course, um, English, Extended, Hoshi, which was uh, maybe still is template, Ruby template rendering. So you could make your own foundation with kind of your mix of layers. Each one of these was a layer to determine what foundation you wanted. But you also have something here called autocode. This is, I'm going for a second dependency uh, built with waves that I find quite interesting, and we'll dive into that now. Autocode. Better auto-loading in 2008. Gosh, this was a bit ahead of its time. If we're going to pattern matching and now auto-loading um, from, from its own dependency. Uh, so it was released and subsequently included in the Waves organization. It has not received a commit since 2009, but remarkably, it works perfectly fine on Ruby 3.0, so you can go play with it today. It allows you to match resources with desired paths. So say we have my given model here, um, Schwad called fish returns flip on flop. I don't like foo or bar. And then I go into my application loader here and I say anything that's a model viewer or controller, 
in these paths, I want you to auto load it. But of course, don't load it until I need it. And say I included my class here, a put statement to make sure it doesn't, you know, uh, load too early. And then, yeah, this just works as expected. You don't have the, the call happen until you actually hit the model and module there. It also gave you methods to reopen classes or modules without clobbering on reload. But this is a solved problem today. <laughs> um, we have this fantastic dependency, with it, which is Sidefic, which works well with any Ruby application. If you haven't tried it, use it. You can kind of alleviate yourself of having to think about requires um, unless you have specific require-based needs. And I had to try it out on a benchmark to see if they were comparable. And unsurprisingly, Sidefic was 3.6 times faster. And as a side note, on Ruby 3, this is Ruby 2. Uh, it was four times faster. So go to work, uh, Xavier, Noria, it is uh, four times faster. Uh, Ruby Waves had a lofty roadmap, which never quite got achieved. Like I said, it seemed to stall after a year and a half of excitement. So my assessment for Ruby Waves was, again, never really fully got off the ground. They keep saying things were in progress, but it just never like became ubiquitous, not even like Nitro did. So could it be, here's my theory, that it was hoovered up or vacuumed up for non-British people <laughs> by MERB for all the people that wanted a popular alternative framework in 2008, 2009. It offered modularity, but MERB seemed to be better at that. Also, it seemed to be a bit more of a passion project. And was it coming at a time when the market share was crowded for Ruby? You know, if you wanted to be alternative Ruby, you had options. And then when you think about 2009, Merv was merging into another Ruby framework at the time. So was there kind of a com uh, community uh, you know, move towards one thing where, where, with a lot of merge work happening in 2009? So there weren't as many engineers that were interested in trying out something new. Is this, is this where we kind of drifted where we are today, where we have some fantastic web frameworks in Ruby? And I'm very honored by people who work on them. But we don't have you know, new ones cropping up twice a year. Um, and, and I'll give a list of like at least 10 that I couldn't cover for this talk. There were a lot. It's very interesting. And something that we'll see with our last framework and with these others is there's a huge emphasis on modularity. And I wonder if people now, as interesting as that is, just say, with modern computing, I'll just take the whole app or the whole framework. And if I don't need the thing, I'll keep it because I might need this thing later, right? But people seem like, no, I only want to use what the bare minimum of what I need to use. That's a big theme I see from 2005 to at least 2010 in the Ruby community. One more framework, and this one may be my favorite, Remaze. Um, it was unveiled in November 2006 as marketed to be a middle ground between Merv and another popular Ruby web framework. Um, it was modular, but still MVC, and it was inspired by Nitro. You, you might be, you might notice that there's a certain word and, uh, I have not said during my Ruby web framework talk the entire time. And I'm not going to say the word. I've made it a challenge to not say the word. But I'll give you a screenshot from Remaze of announcing itself. Remaze is not this. <laughs> so it had a big unveiling. Uh, so it came out uh, in 2006, but uh, Peter Cooper with Ruby Inside, which is now Ruby Weekly, announced it and shout out to Peter Cooper, who is like the Herodotus of Ruby history, um, at least to 2007 or six. Um, but it, uh, it debuted to much acclaim. And the cool thing about Remaze is it works. You can run it now, go open your laptop. You can do it during the talk. I won't be offended, it's remote talk, I can't see. Um, but it's okay, so you have to use Ruby 2. I think with a couple of bug fixes in an hour, you could get it working on Ruby 3, that kind of thing. But it works in 2022 on an M1, which is quite exciting for something that's not been used in a long time. The homepage is still up and kicking, so you can actually review the documentation. This is the most alive framework of anyone I will talk about today. So again, I love using Ruby Talk to kind of see what people felt back in the day. And this discussion in uh, Ruby Talk from 2009 alleged that Remaze took up where Nitro left off, right? And that's where I see that there's this great influence there. And also using Ruby Talk, you can see when it kind of died off. So the last comment was 2012, 
which again, you can kind of think maybe it was dead by 2010 or 2009 as well, similar time as Waves. Um, but, you know, there's this last person who's like goofing around with coffee script and wants to get it working on Remaze, right? Um, Remaze's mission statement talked a lot about, you know, keeping it simple, um, trying to embrace a bit of modularity, making things, you know, developer friendly and finding a few middle grounds out there but also being you know, very easy to wield, right? So the quick example here is pretty straightforward. You have an action, routing is baked in, and you have a nifty core to start with. And you have your page working locally. This is a screenshot from me actually running it. The one app I could get running, which wasn't the purpose of this talk, but you had to try. And I keep showing directory structure here to show you that uh, despite a few things, uh, being different, even if you're not on Rack, for example, a lot of these concepts and directories seem to be roughly the same. But this is the most interesting thing you'll see about Remaze, I think, which ties in with a concept from Waves, um, is concerns about routing in the controller instead of having a routes RB or something or a different file. And I think this is quite an interesting concept because now I know how people can get to the posts controller with a forward slash in this case, you know, what is the path that brings me into the actions of this controller? And it supports view mapping, which I think is quite exciting and something that I definitely consider hijacking so that you have that concern of the path to the controller in the controller instead of a file that might become thousands of lines long eventually and very difficult to handle. Um, I love that concept. It supported a lot of template engines. A third of these I haven't heard of, so this might be quite a good separate Ruby archaeology blog or talk at some point for somebody. Um, and it used to provide syntax to uh, handle various types um, like JSON and whatnot. It was all built on a core. So remember earlier we had the, the raw gem uh, with Nitro. This was built on innate. So innate was its core that you could also build like a vanilla Ruby um, you know, web app with just innate and handle it like this. So it did all the core stuff. And the idea was that Remaze had all the sugar and beautiful extra things, but you could do everything with innate. Now, innate had an interesting dependency that wasn't gemified, but basically could have been called Itani. So beyond map, this is the second thing I found really interesting with Remaze. Itani was a raw stripped down like part of Remaze with template rendering. So this was their default. If you didn't want to use ERB or Hamel or something, you could use their templating engine, which just, you know, raw Ruby interpolation here, and then the question mark R syntax for doing raw Ruby code. It also alleged that it was fast at the time. So let's test it. And this is what we're testing with. This is Itani. This is it. Um, I've sent this to a few uh, uh, core, like core members and senior staff. So it's interesting to reason. I'll, I'll share that after. But if it's the fastest, what can we compare it to? Well, I used a 2001 Honey Badger blog, which had the ERB Hamel Slim benchmark, threw in the Itani on the same benchmark. And yes, 14 years later, it is the fastest. It is twice as fast as ERB, faster than Slim, faster than Hamel. This is great. You don't need to listen to anything else. And just that's the end of the discussion. But big credit to Kokobun, a uh, maintainer of ERB and Hamel, and lots of other things, and Noah Gibbs who have done a lot of things for this community and helped me with my benchmark to see that actually ERB is faster if you do this appropriately, and, and that's fine. But I still think you might want to play with Itani, so I've gemified it for you. Gem install Itani today, and now you have access to it. It's feasibility in 2022. This could be the biggest winner because you can run it in M1 with Ruby 2. And its core is interesting, and Itani is interesting, and I suggest playing around with it yourself. There's so many more of these that I could have covered, but I don't have time. Here's 10 of them, Iowa, Vintage, Wisteria. Um, like, have a look at those if you can. But I hope that I've kind of inspired you today to dig into the web application side of Ruby, be interested in it, explore the old stuff, and possibly build something yourself with your creative mind. So I'm looking forward to see what you do. Um, thank you so much for having me. Please connect with me. This is my Twitter handle, best way to get a hold of me. And I'm very grateful to be able to speak here today. And thank you very much for your time.